so determining solubility. Determining if chemicals will dissolve or mix is based on the similarity between their forces. As we've discussed before in this unit, we use the term like dissolves like. So polar molecules are going to dissolve and interact with other polar molecules. And nonpolar molecules will dissolve other nonpolar molecules. So polar with polar, so their dipoles will line up, and then nonpolar with nonpolar molecules. So their temporary dipoles will interact. We've also discussed in this unit that ions can be attracted to polar molecules to make ion dipole forces, which allows them to dissolve. So since our ions have a charge, either positive or negative, they can attract to the opposite charge of a dipole created in a polar molecule. So let's talk about a term that, or two terms that are used in chemistry and the difference between them. So dissolve versus dissociate. So when substances held together by intermolecular forces mix with one another, so when we have those molecular compounds held together by intermolecular forces, when they mix with one another, we describe that as dissolving. Each of the chemicals molecules that are mixed stay intact but the different chemicals attract through intermolecular forces with each other. So we've got this example down here on the left, um, the red, gray, and white molecules that are shown here and here are sugar molecules or sucrose, and we've got water molecules that they are interacting with. So the water molecules stay water, the sucrose stays sucrose, and they just interact with each other, and it breaks the molecules of sucrose apart. Now, when an ionic compound like sodium chloride is added to a polar substance to create the ion dipole forces, we say that the ionic compound is dissociating. This means they are separating into their ions. So the ions are actually breaking away from each other. And you can see in the um, animation here that the um, positive sodium or positive ions are surrounded by water with the red oxygen. Um, surrounding that positive ion um, because the oxygen side is negative and the um, so it's going to attract to the positive ions when we look at the negative ions um, in green there we can see that the positive hydrogens come in and surround those negative ions so those are interacting with those ion dipole forces so we call this dissociating so let's take a look at an example and how we might um, answer this. So the structure for glucose is um, C6H12O6 and cyclohexane C6H12. Those are both shown. Identify the types of intermolecular, for, intermolecular attractive forces in pure glucose and pure cyclohexane. So this would be like a free response question in on our AP exam. Um, so we want to identify their types of intermolecular forces. Well, on the left glucose, we can see we've got these um, OHs all the way around our molecule. So those allow for hydrogen bonding. And it does mention that we want the types and it does have that um, S there, so we can also include our London dispersion forces. We can go ahead and list that for, for both. Um, since they will both have London dispersion forces, they're both molecules. The other thing we see here is we've got this oxygen. It's going to have lone pairs on it. It's got that bent structure. That's going to also allow this to have dipole-dipole forces for glucose. Now, our other molecule, the cyclohexane, only has carbons and hydrogens. It can't hydrogen bond. It does not have any dipoles, so it only has London dispersion forces. So letter B is the type of um, question we might be asked about solubility. So it says glucose is soluble in water, but that's a typo, but cyclohexane is not soluble in water. Explain. So glucose... Um, like water has hydrogen bonding um, 
as well as London dispersion forces and dipole dipole forces. So it can attract to water. Whereas our C um, 6H12 cyclohexane um, is nonpolar. You can put that. And only has London dispersion forces. Okay, I would want to add a little bit more to this, but I'm running out of space, so I'm going to move it up here. Um, let's give ourselves a little more space. So um, C6H12 is nonpolar and only has London dispersion forces. It will not be soluble in water since water will be more attracted to other water molecules. All right, so if we imagine that we put this uh, glucose in water, they will have form these attractions to each other and mix with one another. But if we put the cyclohexane in water, then this doesn't have very strong forces. The water molecules that are already there are going to be attracted to the other water molecules that are also there. So they're not going to have any desire to attract to the cyclohexane. So as the water molecules attract to each other, they kind of push the cyclohexane out and we get those layers. We get that immiscible um, chemicals and we get layers. So it's not, it is not soluble. Let's look at another example. A 50 milliliter sample of C6H14 liquid is mixed with a 50 milliliter sample of water and the mixture is shaken vigorously. The two liquids do not stay mixed but instead form two separate layers. All right, the density of hexane, so that's what this is, is 0.66 grams per milliliter and the density of water is one gram per milliliter. So we know we've got a container with two layers of liquid, okay? We've got their densities of each. So I'm going to go ahead and determine which one's going to be on top and which one's going to be on bottom. Well, the lower the density, the more it will um, float, so, or be towards the top. So this is going to be my C6H14. This is going to be my water, since it is more dense. It will go towards the bottom. Now, a one gram sample of iodine, I2, um, that's a solid, is added to the mixture, which is shaken again. Which of the following best predicts what will happen to the I2 solid? All right, so we're adding iodine. I2, um, one of our diatomic molecules, would be nonpolar. So if we added it to this, container and shook it up, we're going to still get this C6H14 and water layers and our nonpolar chemical is going to dissolve in the other nonpolar substance, in the nonpolar solvent. So we're going to get I2, which is nonpolar, in that top layer. So I2 will be found mainly in the top layer. So those two are correct, A and C, because they have, say it's being found in the top layer. And it says, because it will dissolve more in water, that's not true. Or letter C, because it will dissolve more in C6H14. And there is our answer. All right, so you can see we know it's not in the bottom layer. We know it's in the top, so we can eliminate two answers, narrow it down, and then read the rest to figure out which one is true. So this is a good example of looking at solubility in a multiple choice question. Let's look at another multiple choice question. Sodium chloride, NaCl, is least soluble in which of the following liquids? Okay, so it's not going to be very soluble in which of the following. 
Um, so sodium chloride, we've got a metal and a non-metal, which means we've got positive and negative ions. So for it to dissolve, we need to have polar molecules because we need those dipoles with the positive and negative end of our dipoles. Um, so we need polar molecules. Well, we know water is polar, so it will definitely dissolve in water. We know, um, I know for a fact HF is polar because that's going to form hydrogen bonds, so that's definitely polar. And I can see on my CH3OH, that OH part can form hydrogen bonds, so that's got some polarity to it. So it will be least soluble in a nonpolar chemical, all right? So that means these three that are polar are not our answers. We want the one that's nonpolar. That's a weird P, all right? Nonpolar makes it the least soluble. All right, let's look at one more example of how we use um, solubility to answer questions. Uh, so identify all forces of attraction in pure water and pure acetone. And we've got a secondary um, question. So let's call this first one part A. So in water, we know, we've talked about water many times, it has um, London dispersion forces, you can list dipole, dipole, but you don't have to really because hydrogen bonding is a version of that. Um, but we've got, uh, we can also list dipole, dipole if you wish. And then for the other one, acetone. So I'm just gonna write my formula for acetone. I got C3H, one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, so there's my acetone. It definitely has London dispersion forces. Right, all our chemicals do. Um, it's got this one oxygen sticking up, so we've got a dipole there towards that electronegative oxygen. So it's definitely polar, but that oxygen doesn't have a hydrogen. So this would have uh, dipole, dipole forces. All right, dipole, dipole forces. Um, none of our hydrogens are connected to oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine, so we do not have hydrogen bonds. So let's look at letter B, the second part. KCl, potassium chloride, is, solu is a soluble ionic compound. Is it more attracted to water or acetone? Explain. So we want to explain which one of these two would it be more attracted to? Well, the way we can determine that is by the strength of our dipoles. We know um, we've got this dipole on our acetone. We also have these dipoles in water. Um, attracting it. Now, which one's stronger? Okay, which one has stronger dipoles and can attract those positive and negative ions in KCl? Well, we can do that based on our difference in electronegativity. Carbon and oxygen are nearer to each other on the periodic table, so their difference in electronegativity isn't as big as oxygen and hydrogen, since hydrogen is much further away on the periodic table. So water is more polar and that's really what creates that hydrogen bonding as well we don't form hydrogen bonds between water and KCl but that its ability to hydrogen bond tells us that it has really strong dipoles so water is more polar due to the difference in electronegativity between O and H, making it better at attracting potassium and chlorine ions. So it would be more soluble. All right, is it more attracted to water or acetone? It would be more attracted. So water is more polar due to the difference in electronegativity between oxygen and hydrogen, making it better at attracting, attracting potassium and chlorine ions. So that's how we can answer that one. So those are um, just some examples of how we can think about solubility in our substances and answer some multiple choice and free response questions about chemicals mixing with one another. All right, thanks guys.